Okay, um, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today for the seminar. Um, we're going to be looking at a study uh, which was using community-based participatory research to explore travel women's food and exercise behaviours. So I just want to acknowledge that there was a lot of people involved in this study, um, including Anne and Anne-Marie Rogan from the Southern Traveller Health Network, uh, myself and Jennifer Russell, Aideen O'Leary and Barry Tyner from the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health, Denise Cahill and Julianne Prendeville from the HSE South Department of Health Promotion and Improvement, Deirdre O'Reilly from the HSE South Traveller Health Unit, and uh, more currently, um, Traveller Women and Maria Young and Hazel Hurley have been involved in developing a video which is based on the findings of the study. Um, so what we're going to be doing uh, this, uh, this lunch time is uh, talking uh, first of all about the Southern Traveller Health Network and Anne is going to give you an introduction to the network and uh, the question that it posed. Um, then I'll talk through the research process. Um, we'll have a, a quick look at some of the prior knowledge about travellers' health that was available prior to starting on the study. Um, then we'll have a look at uh, we'll have a look at a summary of the research analysis and the findings, and we'll talk a little bit as well about the actions and the dissemination uh, of the of the findings. And we'll have hopefully a bit of time at the end for our questions and answers and discussion. So I'll hand over now to Anne to introduce the Southern Traveller Health Network and its research question. Yeah. You're all right, probably, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like maths, you know, there's no one to prove it out. But um, yeah, so it's, my name is Anne Burton, I work with the Southern Traveller Health Network. And um, the, the, the reps in the network come from five travel projects. Um, there are two travel projects in the city and three in the county, one in Kerry, is that six? There's, yeah, so there's five travel projects um, apart from Kerry, and they identify volunteers and they send them to the SDHN and we do training um, in capacity building with the reps. And there's around uh, around 20 women in the in the, in the Southern Travel Health Network, travel women from the different projects. Um, what we do is we identify issues that affect travellers and we do some training on the issues and then we come up with a response to it. So. We've done training on mental health, we've done training on violence against women, and um, we've done parenting courses with the, with the reps, um, we've done drug and alcohol abuse training. So we've done various types of training. And the women themselves identify the issues that they want to work on. So, uh, I think it's about three years ago now, maybe a bit more. <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Maybe, um, yeah, maybe a bit more um, traveller women in our group wanted to look at the issue of... Um, yeah, we'll just take a moment here maybe to let a couple of more members of the audience to, to join us. <coughs> Thank you, you're welcome. This is the... So the travel women decided they wanted to do some work on um, diet and obesity. Um, and one of the, when we looked at the training that was there for this, it was the food pyramid and you know what people are eating. And it was very much about personal choice. And the women said, look, you know, we've been doing the food pyramid for years and it's not making a, it's not making a difference in our lives. It's not impacting on our lives. So, why, with all the knowledge and the information that we have, are women still overweight? Um, so we brought this back to our committee, and Denise Cahill from HSC, she's sitting there with us, the most of us there, Denise. <laughs> <laughs> so Denise um, suggested we do some research with UCC to look at that, that very question, you know, why when you give a community so much information, what happens when the issues 20, 20 years down the line are the same? So there must be something that's wrong, and we decided to look at that. Um, and I'll hand you back to Mary now, because Mary, we, we, we approached UCC, of course, Mary, for, to help us with the research. So, um, essentially, as, as Anne was saying there, it was um, a reflective question that these women were asking themselves about their um, food choices, food consumption, physical activity, and exercise. And um, the process then that we went through was, as Anne has already mentioned, the SDHN sought support from the HSE South Department of Health Promotion, 
it contacted us in terms of us hopefully providing some um, support in terms of designing a research study. And essentially, a partnership was formed between the STHM and our department, and the HSE stayed on in a support capacity. And the study was funded by the Southern Traveller Health Unit. Um, they provided funding to the STHM. <coughs> The study began out as quite a small scale project, um, so it was a Master of Public Health student who undertook it, but the project was actually extended at a later stage. Um, a literature review was undertaken, which was kind of the classical process of uh, beginning a, a, any research project, and a theoretical framework was developed. So I'll talk about those as well as we, we go through this, um, this presentation. Um, and I suppose what we essentially were doing was we were trying to find the most appropriate research methodology um, and we identified that to take a participatory approach was the best way forward and that was uh, teased through and, and agreed with the research team. Ethical approval for the study was sought and that was secured um, through the Clinical Research Ethics Committee uh, here in UCC and at the CUH. Um, and the research participatory, participatory research process then, um, 20 members of the Southern Traveller Health Network were the participants in our study, and our data collection methods were based on focus groups, and we used something called a vignette. Um, some of you may have heard of a vignette previously. If not, it's, it's a way of describing a scenario, so you, you write up a fictional scenario with which the participants will identify. So we created a, a vignette based on the, a little bit of information about a traveller woman called Margaret. She was a 30-something year old woman and factors in her life that were influencing her food choices, her food consumption and her participation in physical activity and exercise. Um, when we had our vignette, we decided it would be important to try to pilot it. So uh, <laughs> community health workers who are working at the Travel Visibility Group they formed our pilot group and they gave us very good information on the appropriateness of the vignette and made suggestions about trying to improve it. And at that stage then we were working very closely with um, Anne and Anne-Marie of the Southern Traveller Health Network who were involved in recruiting the participants. They were providing advanced information to the participants and um, spe speaking to them about the process of giving informed consent so that that was done in a careful um, and uh, an appropriate manner. So we had our 20 participants who had volunteered and we divided them into three groups, A, B and C. Each of the groups was interviewed twice and those days of interviews were two, uh, two weeks apart and all of the interviews were audio recorded. On the first day of the focus groups, we explored factors influencing food choice and consumption and on the second day of focus groups, we explored factors influencing physical activity and exercise. And, and there was obviously an overlap as well in terms of the, the content uh, on those two days. <coughs> in terms of the theoretical framework for our study, um, I suppose it's, it's important to acknowledge that a key starting point was that we approached the study recognising travellers as an ethnic minority group. And um, that would have been something that was disputed here in Ireland until relatively recently. On the 1st of March this year, travellers' uh, ethnic minority status was recognised by the Irish government. Um, well, we took that as our starting point anyway uh, in, in 2013. The study was also informed by a social determinants of health perspective and secondly by the life course perspective on food choices, which was something that we identified through our literature review. So, um, obviously there's a lot of prior research already done on travellers' health status, so we, we took some of that information on board where it might be influential and, and important uh, for our study. So, for example, the All-Ireland Traveller Health Study published in 2010, it has identified that travellers experience very severe health inequities by comparison with the general population. Travellers experience significantly lower life expectancy, they have higher infant mortality rates, higher rates of sickness, and shockingly, a suicide rate which is six times that of the general population. And some of you may or may not have seen this pyramid before. Um, this is from the, the census in 2011, which indicates that 
The traveller population is the one that is indicated here in the brown triangle, um, and that's a comparison then with the more typical kind of onion-shaped um, population uh, profile, which would be typical of most Western countries. The brown traveller population pyramid is, I suppose, more commonly uh, comparable with populations in the Southern Hemisphere in countries that experience uh, significant levels of poverty. So travellers' health status is already, I suppose, quite well studied and, and understood. In terms of travellers' social determinants of health, we drew from the All-Ireland Traveller Health Study. So, for example, there is evidence from 2010 that typically traveller families are larger in size <coughs> and they live in smaller homes. They have lower levels of population, or sorry, education than the general population higher rates of unemployment. Uh, among travellers, they highly rate family support among the traveller community. Um, interestingly, by comparison with the um, medical card holders in the Sloan 27 study, or two, yeah, 2007 study, traveller women had higher rates of exercise than medical card holders. And travellers have a higher intake of fried foods uh, by comparison with the general population and a lower intake of food and vegetables. Um, other factors that are important in terms of travellers' social determinants of health, um, travellers have a high level of trust within their own community, but when they look to the general population, 48% of travellers feel that most people can't be trusted, which is very significant. Um, complete trust in health professionals is only held by 41% of travellers, and that would be compared to 83% um, of having a complete level of trust in the general population. And the All-Ireland Traveller Health Study did a, replicated the study that had been undertaken in Boston in the USA, which had looked at experiences of discrimination experienced by black, Latino and working class white adults in Boston. And they replicated this study within the All-Ireland Traveller Health Study and by comparison with the rates of discrimination experienced by those populations in America, travellers' experiences of discrimination here in Ireland were much, much higher. So, moving on to what we were doing then. So we gathered our data through the focus groups, and then we, um, recorded, we took all the recordings, the audio recordings, from the um, focus groups, and they were transcribed. Mm -hmm. um, a thematic analysis approach was taken and on the, the, the data from the first day was analysed by the MPH student with supervision. But subsequently we felt that um, we had gathered such a lot of very interesting and very rich data. Myself and Jennifer Russell, who were the co-supervisors for the student, we, we didn't want to abandon the project at that stage. We felt that we had made a commitment, we would formed a partnership with uh, quite a number of people and we felt that we wanted to follow through and complete the research process. <coughs> so the full data set was reanalyzed uh, by myself and Jennifer and we also undertook um, a wider review of the international uh, literature. Um, one of the things I suppose that we wanted to include within the, the literature review was um, <coughs> literature on ethnic minority groups in other countries, particularly uh, women uh, in ethnic minority groups. So following this uh, process of analysis, we identified five main themes, and within those there were also a number of sub-themes. Um, we began, we gathered the data in 2013, and in 2014, we went back to the Southern Traveller Health Network and the participants, and we presented them with our draft findings, because we wanted to discuss our draft findings with them, and we wanted to see were they plausible, were they credible, and were they willing to verify um, what we were, uh, the interpretation essentially that we had uh, put on the, on the findings. And uh, thankfully that, that process went, went very well. It was also the first time that Jennifer had actually worked with the, um, with the traveller women. Uh, prior to that, uh, the MPH student Aideen and myself had done the data collection. So it was very interesting for Jennifer to actually uh, meet the traveller women at that stage. So uh, we'll move on now to the dominant themes uh, within, our, within our findings. 
Um, we combined the food choice and food consumption data with the exercise data because, as I mentioned earlier on, even in the focus group discussions, there was an overlap. And certainly when it came to the analysis, it, it made sense to, to integrate them. So the five dominant themes were um, psychosocial stress, cultural factors, social factors, individual level factors, and environmental factors. So we look first at the psychosocial factor, uh, psychosocial stress. Um, from our findings, we could clearly see that traveler women experience high levels of both chronic and acute stress. Their roles as women in an ethnic minority community are extremely demanding, very busy, and also quite constrained. And they described always being on call within the extended family network in the traveller community. And also, they described frequently experiencing high levels of worry, fear about their families and their futures, very high levels of grief and, and tragedy. And again, that, the, the experiences of high infant mortality rates, suicide, um, serious illness, etc. That, that, that corresponds, those would be some of the factors that would lead to this chronic and acute stress that both the women experience. They experience um, pressure also to conform to cultural norms and they are expected by their community to be uh, coping all of the time. And they themselves put a lot of pressure on themselves to cope. They are essentially came across as very stoic in, in their, in their um, lives. And the stress that they are experiencing from these various sources, is, they described how it directly impacts on their food choice and food consumption. So the quote here on the right side of the slide uh, is from one of the participants. And she says, you carry your brothers, sisters, mothers, aunts, uncles, nephews, and nieces. Do you know such a one is coming and telling you their problems? You're still here and you're still unconsciously carrying it too. So the extended family network is very important within the traveler community. Um, and it's a huge source of support, as travellers themselves have identified, but it also leads people to experiencing and sharing um, a lot of stress, a lot of grief, a lot of worry. Moving on to cultural factors, um, I think this is possibly where the, the study um, is hopefully you know, break, breaking some new ground as well, because it was providing insights which certainly weren't av available within the literature um, on, on travellers. Um, it was very clear to us from what the women were telling us was that families' needs come before individual needs. Um, and this perhaps is, uh, by comparison with the general population in Ireland, this is something that is uh, not, not as common. We came across the concept of familism within the literature. And it was very interesting because familism has a couple of aspects to it. And it, it helped us to understand um, cer certain aspects of travel culture. So um, a quote here again, illustrating this point about family needs coming before individual needs. So you have to be a certain way. You don't think about yourself, you think about everyone else. And after they're all looked after, there is no time to think about yourself. So familism, the concept of familism, as I said, there's two different aspects to it. First of all, there's this idea of the family coming first. But secondly, familism then, for communities that might feel threatened or marginalized or excluded, <coughs> familism also serves as a defense mechanism. It's a way of people protecting themselves against external hostility. So, you know, in that sense, familism could be considered to be quite a logical response. It's a, it's a protective mechanism. Other things that were identified in relation to food, for example, um, the women were describing that there was a lack of routine around meal times. Um, the traveller economy, as it would be understood, is quite a spontaneous, opportunistic, taking, taking chances to earn a living when they arise type of approach to our, um, an economy. So um, they would have spoken quite a lot about the men and uh, the young men and maybe even teenage boys coming and going into the family home and that there wasn't a, a routine around mealtimes as a result of this, this movement, this coming and going. 
Um, and therefore, they, they found that hard then to make choices and to control and to, to manage things that were happening around food consumption. Also for themselves, they found they spent a lot of time in the kitchen catering for the needs of whoever would turn up and, and be looking for, looking for a meal. Food customs and cultural identity came out very strongly um, within our findings. And the women, this is a very interesting quote here, which kind of captures a lot of what we were, we were learning. You always put on a big dinner, just in case, because you're always expecting other people are going to be there, so you want to share it. So the women spoke to us about traveler traditions and customs of having large pots of food, stew, for, for example, or bacon and cabbage, um, and that when travelers in the past traveled a lot more than they do nowadays, they, they needed to do that because somebody might arrive and they would look after them, they would feed them. Um, and the tradition has actually continued even though travelers are far less mobile than they would have been in the past. So as part of their cultural identity and as part of maintaining food customs, these are practices that travelers or traveler women described that they were still maintaining. Um, they also spoke quite a lot about food cost and the importance of avoiding waste. Um, so there's a downside to having a lot of food cooked, because if you have a lot of food cooked and nobody shows up, you eat it yourself. And this, this is a nice quote from one of, the, one of the women. She said, you'd often have a grand bit of dinner and say, I'm not throwing that away. I'm, I'm eating it. And then the other side of it was, that's the thing I have. It would be a sin. It's a sin. It's a mortal sin to throw out the food. So again, these are very strong and um, strongly held beliefs that, that uh, traveller women were describing. <clears throat> Other cultural factors that we needed to take into account was travellers were describing, which is something I have to say I hadn't anticipated at all, was a history of food insecurity. And when we looked at the literature, we found that this was quite significant in terms of food choice and consumption. So uh, an illustrative quote here, you ate what was there because if it wasn't there, uh, you'd, you'd done without it. Sometimes you wouldn't know when you'd next get a dinner. So we had a sample of women from their 20s through to their 60s, more women in their late 30s, 40s, 50s, and into their 60s than, than women in their 20s. And for some of these women, this was a real personal experience. This was part of their lived experience, that they, as children, had grown up not knowing where the next meal came from. And that history was uh, essentially something that they had uh, taken on board, and it was something that was part of influencing their current choices around food. Other things that the women spoke to us about was, for example, there was a cultural acceptance um, of over overweight, they related it to pregnancy and motherhood. And again, traveler women would perhaps, uh, particularly in the past, have had large families. They also, again, perhaps linked with this history of food insecurity, they, they were very happy if babies were chubby. A chubby baby was a strong, healthy baby, a baby that could survive. And obviously for mothers right around the world and fathers too, um, survival of your children is very, very important. And they had a, a very significant fear of children being hungry. So even nowadays, they talked about a fear of children being hungry and about showing that they loved their children through providing them with food. So um, within the literature, we came across this uh, concept of the food insecurity obesity paradox. And the literature was telling us that women who have experienced food insecurity are more likely to be overweight and obese. And there is evidence that there's a greater impact on women with children of food insecurity than there is on men or women without children. And it is speculated that childhood food insecurity can be manifested into adulthood and continue to influence food choices and food consumption. And also the literature tells us that those who live on low incomes are more likely to buy low cost, energy dense foods to ensure that their energy needs are met. Again, linked with a history of food insecurity. So moving on then to the social factors that we found. Racial discrimination and social exclusion featured very prominently in, in the discussions with the women. They spoke about a lifelong exposure to racial discrimination and social exclusion. 
They described how it lowers their self-esteem and self-worth, how it limits participation in wider society, including social life, and being physically active and taking exercise. Um, and they spoke about, for example, not feeling welcome in health clubs or gyms or swimming pools, um, perhaps feeling um, at risk of discrimination if they were out walking on the, on the street. Um, so these were real, real factors that they were speaking about. They also talked about, um, they asked questions like, well, what is the point in making an effort to look good if you can't go out, if, you, if your social life is so limited? And we, we talk about that, about that a little bit further on again. And they also described um, that they would have a strong sense of discomfort among settled people. Um, and again, it seemed to be that over the course of generations, there was less contact among current generations of travellers with settled people than there was in, in the past. In fact, it seems to be a deteriorating situation in terms of travellers and settled ha having uh, everyday interactions with each other. Um, and this quote was, was interesting because within it, the, the participant was describing travellers and equating their position in society with that of black people. That's why we can't stop and talk to them, meaning settled people, for so long, because that's in our head. It's there all the time, kind of beating us as if we're black. You're black over there in that corner and stay over there, kind of. Keep away from the rest of us. So travellers are, the, the, this participant was describing her experience of social exclusion and racial discrimination in, in very strong terms and equating that with you know, the position of, of, of the, the marginalisation that black people can experience in some societies. The other aspect then of social support or social factors was social support. And again, the travellers in this study um, their, their discussions um, very closely resembled those from the All-Ireland Traveller Health Study, where travellers were identifying that other travellers are hugely important to them. Support from the community <coughs> is critical. They also talked about that it's a cultural norm among travellers to be in groups or to be in pairs. So the settled community doesn't necessarily um, perhaps behave in, in that fashion, um, to the same extent at least. Travellers will always want to be in pairs, essentially is what they were telling us, or they would prefer to be in groups. That is how they live, that is how they socialise, that is how they work. Um, so the settled community might look on the pairs or the groups of travellers and, and perceive it negatively, but for travellers it's hugely important. And again, it's part of this protective mechanism it can serve as a protective mechanism against the hostility that travellers can experience. For the women, being with other traveller women is central to participating in traveller activities, or is there in, in, in activities, whether they be physical, physical activities, uh, educational activities, health promotion activities, and this, this social support is very protective against racial discrimination. So it has a clear rationale and a clear <coughs> function for, for traveller women. Moving on then to individual level factors. Um, it was clear from speaking to the women that many of them have a low level of education qualification. Again, that evidence marries with the All-Ireland Traveller Health Study. And what we found as well within the, the literature was that um, health education is not the same as education. Health education providing people with information is not the same as people having a good, strong general education and high educational attainment. The women were describing a low level of con control over food choices. And again, interestingly, the literature tells us that women with lower educational attainment feel that they have less control over food choices within their families. The preferences of the traveller men and boys when it came to food choices, these were typically accommodated. And the women also spoke about needing to avoid stress about food and needing to avoid food waste. So these are some quotes that I think are helpful in illustrating the, the, the situation. It's, it's simpler for her, they were speaking about the her being Margaret in the vignette, 
it's simpler for her to eat whatever the children are eating or he is eating, you know. It's easier just to go along with things. And another woman said, so you go for convenience all the time. You have to for the sake of sanity. So this is the lived experience for, for the women. Some other individual level factors then that they described were having a lack of energy and a lack of time due to caregiving demands, due to being so responsible within their families and within the extended family. They also talked about laziness and they described that nowadays travellers are almost always travelling by car or by van, which would be very different than previous generations of travellers who would have been far more likely to move about on foot. Um, they also talked about having short-term motivation to improve diet or to take exercise or to be more physically active. And that was typically linked to upcoming social occasions. So for example, if there was a wedding coming up or a christening or a first communion or a confirmation, they would get galvanized for six to eight weeks, you know, have a, have a, a serious effort at trying to improve diet and exercise, and then that, that would fall away. And they talked about that generally they have a lack of motivation and that their motivation around improving diet and exercise is, is undermined because they said it's almost impossible to socialize due to racial discrimination and that the traditional traveler social events like going to fairs and markets and those kinds of events that those are being undermined <coughs> and being in fact abandoned by the community so short-term motivation possible long-term motivation and, and, and sticking to you know maybe the best laid plans um, it's, it's very challenging for, for the women to, to do so. And I think this quote captures um, the, this perspective in terms of the, the, the challenges. It says, the joy of life is gone, you know. There's no social life. There's no way that you can go out. There's no point in looking well because you're not going to get in anyway. So that's travellers talking about being refused at social venues, at pubs, at restaurants. Um, etc. So moving on then to environmental factors. Um, food cost and food waste. Um, travelers, many traveler families would be living on a low budget and food is considered quite expensive. Again, that would not be something that would be exclusive as, a, as an opinion to, to the traveler community here in Ireland. Food waste is to be avoided, and there's a fear of trying new foods due to the risk of waste. And one of the women said, it comes down to brass tacks, doesn't it? You're going to buy whatever you can afford, so you're probably going to get the cheaper food. Um, women also were acknowledging what we in public health would talk about as the obesogenic environment. They weren't necessarily using that terminology, but they were talking about the fact that they... Um, as many everybody else within um, the community has increased access to convenience food, to takeaways at low cost. And also, particularly the older women were saying quite clearly that in their opinion, contemporary food was far less healthy uh, than, than food that they traditionally ate. And when we looked to the literature review then, the literature review was identifying as some of the major environmental factors, things like global food systems, political industry support for subsidization of less healthy foods and political and industry resistance to taxing um, unhealthy foods and drinks or, or even clear labeling of uh, food, unhealthy foods and drinks. So that was our, our list of, of uh, factors that we and our, our analysis of them. And oh, so apologies, and just from the literature review, I suppose this wasn't material that we were talking about, but information that we came up, uh, through the literature review, we were, I suppose, finding that, again, there is a growing scientific understanding of overweight and obesity. Chronic stress is known to interfere with normal hormonal balance. It interferes with appetite and it interferes with weight gain. Pregnancies are also associated with weight gain. And again, travel women would often have had a significant number of pregnancies. And there is this link between food insecurity and its impact on, on weight, appetite, and consumption. 
And I suppose there's a growing scientific understanding as well that there are, you know, um, physiological challenges for people who have already become overweight or obese in trying to lose weight. The body gets into this kind of process of trying to re-establish homeostasis and the body is actually reluctant to, to lose weight in, in, in the long run. So these are things that we needed to take into account when we were thinking of, in terms of the, the analysis. And as I said, not directly from the women themselves, but information we found which was valuable from the, the literature review. Um, and I think these are things that we must take into account. So for example, people who are working within health promotion and public health must take this kind of evidence into account if they're planning things like weight loss initiatives. And people need to have appropriate expectations which are perhaps more focused on nurturing well-being and maybe not so focused on measuring weight loss or measuring inches and uh, waist circumferences and, and such things. So um, I'm doing the classical thing of like showing you a slide that you, you, you can't read the detail of, but <laughs> just to explain to you what, what's in the slide. Uh, you can probably read a little bit of it anyway. What we have here in the diagram on the left hand side is the information that we found from the international literature. And on the right hand side is the information that our findings within the data that we gathered. So what we found was that there was a, an awful lot of similarity between the social factors that were evident from the international literature and the social <coughs> factors within our data. The same in terms of the psychological factors, the environmental factors, and as I said, the physiological factors was exclusively from the data. Um, that applied to the literature on the food choice <coughs> and consumption, and it also applied to the literature and our findings in relation to physical activity and exercise. So that clearly, I suppose, illustrates that the position of travellers in our sorry, of traveller um, travellers' experiences are are not unique. They bear a strong resemblance to the position of women in ethnic minority groups in in other parts of the world as well. Oh gosh, apologies. So I've just realised I've run a little bit over time. Okay. So just to conclude, uh, I'll, I'll leave the conclusions there. So this was just a final quote then. Healthy eating would be a luxury now to be worrying about <coughs> compared to the other stuff that's going on. So I'll hand you over to Anne. If you have any questions, <laughs> um, sorry, I think we ran a little bit late because we were, we're a bit late starting with the audience going in. Um, so apologies, Anne, I've, I've kind of cut it a bit tight for you. Um, if you have any questions um, with regard to the study, I'm happy to d uh, talk about the, some aspects of it, and Anne will be very happy to talk about some aspects of it as well. So I'll open it up to the floor, and, and sorry, we've, we're a bit tight on time. Would you? We just have all the burning questions. questions. All the burning questions, exactly. Yeah. Do, you want, do you want to stand up there just to turn the recording? Any, any thoughts, any comments? Mm. Mm. Um, so, um, it, it's a really interesting study that you've done there, and, and the results are they're very deep and rich, I think, because I think you had a small cohort, but um, really interesting things that come out. For me, I would say, and other comments would resonate back to maybe my grandparents, you know, they would have always said it doesn't work. Um, and it might go back as well a little bit to maybe, of, I suppose, the, the not so much the westernization, but we were more rural in Ireland than we are now, and so the traveller community had more interaction and so would have been maybe more shared kind of ideals at that time. Mm. Everything you were saying, I'm thinking, my God, my grandmother used to say that, my grandfather used to say that. So I think that's probably where the disconnect is as well, because we're not as rural, perhaps, as we used to be. And um, the other thing to say, because you were talking a lot about, about um, the negative side of traveller health, um, and I was saying to you earlier, we're, we're starting studying the ACP on uh, traveller health and looking at metabolic health in general. But where we started from with our director is um, a gastroenterologist, and he had never in all of his time seen a traveller with irritable bowel disease. And he, he was yes. just careful <laughs> observation of this aspect of it. Um, and then he asked other gastroenterologists, they didn't have any traveller patients either. So How do they know? They didn't have any travellers coming to their clinics for treatment. And I don't think it's probably something that you could probably deal with. Without I know travellers with irritable bowel syndrome. 
but not irritable bowel disease. Oh, disease is different, isn't it? Different, yeah, it's different. Yeah. Um, so we started from that point, but we're, we're going to look at metabolic health. But I think on the positive side, we don't seem to have a lot of this particular disease. And maybe I was looking, as you were putting up there, saying that there was, you know, larger families and smaller environments. There's a great sharing there of, you know, the microbial community, bacteria, viruses, fungi, which are very good for your health. Yes. So that could be an underlying factor that that's a much healthier environment actually for a person in the crowd kind of yeah. and rearing. Um, so anyway, that's just an observation. Right. So there's something positive. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. There was somebody at the back. Hi, um, I'm from Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy and I initially just finished my PhD and I've always been really interested in travellers and travel health because my dad's a traveller. Oh, right. And I'm a musician and have been involved with travel community by music for my entire life so I'm really right. interested in getting into this and it's just fascinating for me to see the work that you've done and this is the question I have is what do you think we should do given these results you know this is really interesting stuff and it's brought up stuff about participation and broader social structures and about family structures and individual factors like what would you recommend now in terms of healthcare services do we need to think about in terms of how we design programs and provide services to travelers based on what you guys have found? Um, I suppose, you know, uh, the approach has been um, an individual, you know, that you know your health is your responsibility kind of thing. And this shows clearly that that's not the case. Um, and I think as well, you know, we need studies like this to show how accommodation, how education impacts on our lives and the are the areas that we need to, to work on, you know, and that there needs to be cross-department um, collaboration. Like, for instance, I sat on a, a, a committee in the Department of Health when the All-Ireland Traveller Health Study was uh, being developed and when it came out it showed clearly that the determinants of health were what you know what why travellers really suffer from bad health not because they didn't have the information and stuff you know from health so when i sat like i thought jesus dear, this is brilliant so i said to um the the, the department official you know so i said well this is clear you know each department needs to talk to the other department and say well if you're not providing proper accommodation and if the department of education is not proper or the department of environment is not providing proper accommodation you know the health is going to be, get worse and worse mm -hmm. and he said Oh, we don't tell each other what to do. And I was kind of thinking, that seems stupid. You know, they're basic things. You know, if they if they don't work with each other, um, and if and I said, well, you're the you're the Department of Health. How you how you feel about paying out all this money for something that's not going to work because the Department of Environment are working with you, and the Department of Education, or even employment? You know, I mean, it's 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 it came out very strong. If you don't have a good job, if you don't have a good education, if you don't have a proper place to live, these basic things. Um, your health is going to deteriorate no matter how much information you have or how um, how many walking groups you're involved in, you know. Yeah. So that's the big um, thing for me. And as well as that, as for me, it was important that we did this because the travel women believed, on top of all this going off them, they felt guilty because they were overweight. And this was a real eye-opener for them and it, for the first time. And I remember getting the report for the very first time and I, couldn't, I didn't have time to read it, so I was going home in the car and I just... I just went in the side of the road and I read it and I cried my heart out because it's one thing living every day with it mm -hmm. but seeing it in black and white you know this this is all happening to us how we're alive at all I, I, I don't know you know I suppose in, uh, 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 one positive is we must be very resilient mm -hmm. you know to, um, to, to to put up with this every day and still carry on um, yeah so for me it's important that we bring this back to the travel women and we show them this is your lives. This is going to. How do you expect to be taking care of yourselves when you're trying to take care of everybody else as well? And we 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 use sometimes in our group um, uh, training resources that aren't culturally appropriate. But this helps us too. And we are doing at the minute. We're creating a video at the minute around the social determinants of health. You know, to use but well, use the service providers, but they also use with traveller groups to show them. You know, this is not all your fault. There's so much going on in your lives. You know, and then maybe target the areas that we can make changes in and we can do something about. But I think it, it very much highlights as well the, race, the racism and the discrimination that travellers experience. And the impact that that racism and discrimination has on health. Yes. I think it's really important that mm. it's not just racism, it's actually a bit unpleasant no. in the staff writing, that it actually directly damages people's health of course. and makes them live yes. shorter lives and poorer quality yeah. lives. And I think sometimes I think we, we like I have a friend who's a lawyer and very much talks about what you're talking about, economic rights, social rights, cultural rights. 
And um, but there isn't that joint of thinking from her mm -hmm. discipline, and we have had wonderful conversations about yeah. that to see actually the, con the con connection between human rights and health. Yes, and that you know not having a job means your health is worse. Yeah, not having the right to participate in yeah. your cultural life means yeah. your health is worse. Yeah. And you need to have that. Mm -hmm. But what's worse than that is being told it's your fault. Yeah. If you make it up and do this, if you may go in and get your education, they say is free for everyone. You can all have education. But we go to education. My, my first experience in education is being told I was a knacker or sitting at the back of the class doing a bit of colouring. There was no expectation of me in, a, in education. So how was I supposed to get a good education? You know, uh, employment, I remember my uh, first job was with second people. And every time they were traveller, well, it wasn't, it wasn't that nice, it was, was used. There'd be a deathly silence, you know, and they'd be looking over at me, you know. I didn't feel comfortable in the employment scene with sick people. To tell you the truth, I was afraid for years of sick people. I wouldn't talk to them, I wouldn't tell them I was a traveller. I remember we getting to our trailer getting towed by guards when we were young, my mother being caught names, my father being caught names. I never ever trusted sick people, you know. And even to today, to today, you know, there's still people who, who believe that's our fault. My sister was at a meeting yesterday in the, in the council, you know, where she was told, um, us travellers all and, and language like, we want to destroy the traveller footprint altogether, you know. The assimilation policy, wanting to make us settle people, to sit in meetings being told that they want to destroy your history, where you came from, to wipe it out. It's, it's a form of the cleansing, you know, but uh, it's not highlighted very much, I don't think. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. <laughs> <My job's great>. <laughs> <laughs> This is the same one that thankfully we really, really fascinating presentation and it shows you know the power of good quality of work and being part of mm. participatory research and, and Mark listen to you. I mean we, we talk in theory to our students about the social terms of health here, the economic and mm. social and political and cultural terms of but you're you lived it and really you know I, I wish I wish all of our students could have heard what you just said because it's this is the reality and typically we sort of um, we, we really think we break health, which is a holistic concept, into these little chunks mm. of psychology or biology or mm. be, be, be behavior. But it, it's all it's all interconnected, and you can't just take one bit mm. and, and, and look at it in in, in isolation. And I say it goes back down to fundamentally education and respect. Mm. Okay. And do you think this research would have been possible in a different way besides community-based participatory research or participatory research? So I guess I'm asking you to talk a little bit about the strengths of the research approach that you did take. Because um, to me, just I, I don't, I can't see how you would have gotten the, the richness and the, the depth or uh, the insights in any other way but the participatory approach. Um. Yeah, I, I'd be inclined to agree with you, Martin. Um, I think the participatory approach, um, you know, uh, and the partnership approach between the Southern Traveller Health Network, all the all the work that Anne and Anne did in terms of selling this idea of a research project to the women. They had come up with a question, but they weren't expecting to be participants in a research project. And then Denise and people within the HSE um, providing support and the Traveller Health Unit providing funding for it. That partnership made it possible, relationships of trust made it possible, yeah. and I think we were probably advantaged insofar as some of us already knew each other already, uh, which was a plus, yeah. but I think that's possible for other communities and other academics to work with communities and to build trust. Um, and then, you know, we, we, were, we had a very straightforward recruitment process, our focus groups happened when they were supposed to happen, people turned up and participated. And we're happy to do so and again to talk to us again a year later when we had our our draft findings um, and i think yeah the conversations were very rich the, the focus group conversations were rich and um, i don't know maybe one-to-one -one interviews might give you a different kind of depth but i think the focus group dynamic was was very positive yeah and i think we must be one of the most researched groups in ireland at this yeah. stage We've had research, research done on us. We've participated in research where we've been told afterwards we can't be shown the contents of the research because it's internal, you know? We've had this, but from the outset, we were very clear. This was our research. 
we were clear about how we wanted to use this research, you know. So I think there was a more of an honesty <coughs> in the women participate in it. And because we, again, like Mary said, we trusted people and we knew what we wanted to do with it. So there was an honesty. Because I didn't want travelers, people come in and ask travelers questions, say, oh yeah, that, that, and that. And it, it wouldn't be the truth at all. But they would know that these people didn't want to really use, didn't, that there wasn't an honesty and, uh, yeah, um, and they didn't know where it was going, you know. But we were very clear from the start where we wanted this research to go and how we wanted it to be used. I, I particularly like the way you brought out the, the voice of the actual people in the research mm -hmm. report and the, the, uh, the statements, because often those kind of qualitative excerpts are kind of hidden in quantitative data. And the fact that you brought that out and you're using the, the exact words that people use is really, really good. It's very powerful. And I'm going to ask you, going back to um, education, um, I would believe that education is a great way to raise the profile of any community or person. So do you have any suggestions in how, I, um, how the department could improve the, um, the, the experience of travellers going into school? Well, I think, you know, uh, my children go to school in, the, in, in primary school, there is nothing about travellers. In secondary school, there's like a sentence, you know, about... And I think the way, if you look at the way the Polish community um, their culture is reflected in schools and different and they have celebration days around people's different culture diversity but not with travelers you know it's almost an embarrassment to the education system to talk about travelers we look for stuff like ethnic identifiers where you know we, 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 we can we will know how many travelers are doing their leaving cert how many are doing their junior cert um, and there's no ethnic identifiers in Ireland so we don't have any evidence base we know ourselves that travelers aren't there's they aren't going on you know to do their their, their leaving cert but um I think just feeling included, you know, just trying to include people more and try to listen to us. Um, the very simple things, my daughter left secondary school for a simple reason. She was embarrassed about her uniform. I asked the school, you know, can she leave her uniform off and put it on when she comes to school in the dressing room or whatever? No, no, she's the same as everybody else. She won't be treated differently. So she left. You know, it's little things. It's just, and travel girls, young travel girls are much more responsible at a young age. And they'll be treated like children. Like, like younger children in the school system. They're very simple things, they're not huge things. It's feeling respected and feeling valued. But how do you do that? How do you make that happen? And I think the education system is like a big institution, you know, like a bit, a bit like our health, but all these big institutions that are crumbling because of the little things, you know, because they've become in big institutions. And the travelers feel there's no room for them. And then the traveler parents have had very bad experiences in school as well. So they don't value it. In fact, they're afraid of it. You know, you're afraid that your, that your child, for your child to become a doctor or a nurse, they will have to abandon their identity. And God knows what will happen to them. And they won't come around you anymore, you know. So you don't exactly, you're not pushing your child in that direction either. And the school has no expectation. So they're kind of lost in it all, you know. So there's a lot of work we need to do with the community. But there's a lot of work that the Department of Education could be doing as well. Questions? Can I just make a comment yeah, that from Denise. a health promotion practitioner perspective, <coughs> I think this is solid gold to to us um, because we have for years taken a you know a lifestyle approach to health promotion in Ireland. And when I trained certainly it was the lifestyle approach of exercise and diet is the key. Um, but it's very important that we do understand the social determinants of health, that we don't just talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for the department here, that's something that we should be, I mean, that these research like this translates the social determinants into reality. And I think the video will, will help to support that as an educational tool as well. But it's important for us to know that by giving people health education when they're stressed and when, you know, it's just another stick to beat them with, mm -hmm. if you're giving them information about the food pyramid without understanding the context. And I think as health, so-called health professionals, we need to step back and realize that communities are experts in their own knowledge mm -hmm. and that they should be leading the way around, mm -hmm. or at least partnering with us in terms of health and health promotions. 